Good afternoon. Welcome to Law and Crime Network. I'm Linda Kenny Bodden. We are in the trial of the McStay family murder. The right now who's on the stand, Henri Cross, is a forensic anthropologist by the name of Dr. Alexis Gray. I'm going to take you right back in the courtroom and we will talk when she's finished. Okay, so I am very pleased to introduce the first time on the Law and Crime Network my guest for today. It is Sylvia Smith. She is a criminal defense attorney in Washington, D.C. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, how are you? Yeah, and we're going to have one question before we go to break, but I just want to let people yeah. know how we met. I had to do a demonstration <laughs> at Harvard doing a direct examination, and you did the cross, and, I, and you said you were terrified with me, which you didn't know. I was terrified of you. So, ladies and gentlemen listening, you are getting the best of the best going to analyze this. Now, Sylvia, this, in this statement, this defendant, any defendant, these people that were victims were not known to be dead until three, over three and a half years later, yet this defendant says 17 days, um, within about two weeks after they go missing, that the, fa the father, whose name was Joseph, Joseph McStay, was my best friend. If you have a piece of evidence like that, where somebody indicates that this word was, is, was instead of is, is that a problem when you're a defense attorney? I think it I think it is a problem. I think most of the time most attorneys are looking at every single word, every single indication, every potential piece of evidence that anybody can find. And so I And the jury is too, right? And the jury is too. Absolutely. The jury is, is paying attention to that. I think the jury pays more attention to what the lawyers sort of direct them to pay attention to. So the prosecutors might in that sense sort of focus on this word was. Um, now, I, I have to I have to cut you short because we have to go to a break. But you hold that thought, and we'll pick it up after the break. Welcome back. I'm Linda Kenny Bodden. As you know, at the Law and Crime Network, we've been covering this trial gavel to gavel from start to finish. We will be there in California. The family of four, Joseph McStay, his wife Summer, two little kids, four and three, found skeletonized in the desert, the Mojave Desert, through over three and a half years after they were last seen by the man on trial, Charles Chase Mayer. I shouldn't say they, I should say Mr. was last seen. Now, this case, uh, Sylvia Smith, my guest for today, who is one of the best best criminal defense attorneys in Washington, D.C., is a building block. When you have a case that's a building block, the DNA in the car, the last time that, indeed, uh, Chase saw him, and I forgot to tell you, there's a cell tower ping near the Mojave Desert Burial Sea. How, as a defense attorney, do you deal with it? How do you, what do you tell the jury? But I think first you have to look at each piece of evidence and realize that it's all circumstantial. This isn't direct evidence of, you know, necessarily actual guilt or actually that he was involved. It's in just other, in other words, direct involved. evidence means I saw him being, you know, them being bludgeoned, right? Exactly. And so when you have circumstantial evidence, one thing you have to look at is whether or not you can rely on that circumstantial evidence. You talked about DNA in the car. You talked about the cell tower. Um, I would dig into each one of those pieces and see how reliable is that information? How reliable was the investigation? Is that DNA, you know, trustworthy? Can you trust the cell site with all pieces of forensic evidence, especially circumstantial evidence like that, um, you know, it goes a lot into how um, how reliable that information right. is. And the right. defense attorney has to look at. And, so, and what, what you are like you doing are doing. That? You're telling us exactly what I do. Each piece has to get attacked separately. I mean, that right. DNA in the truck could be transfer evidence. With the cell tower pin, could be something else. What? Guess what? We have to go again now to a little break and be back on the other side. So stay tuned. We're covering the state trial, California. Okay, so the judge just told us he's going to break. It was really quick. I mean, we're in the middle of a statement of of um, the defendant by the police on February 17, 2010. This is before anybody, well before, years, one, two, three, plus, 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 years before anybody knew that the McStay family had been murdered. So we're going to talk a little bit. 
with my guest today, Sylvia Smith, the wonderful criminal defense attorney from Washington, D.C. Sylvia, I mentioned to you before the break that in this case, the judge did not allow evidence in that some other dude did it, according to the, the defense. Uh, uh, Daniel, Ka uh, David, uh, sorry, Dan Cavanaugh, who was also part of this team working on these water fountains for sale that, that Joseph McStay owned. Now, sometimes if a judge doesn't allow something in, that can recall any great verdict to be reversed, can't it? Yes, absolutely. And, and tell us, tell us, like, wh what what would be an example besides some other dude did it that people would understand? Absolutely. There's a lot of evidence that I guess could create reversible, what we call reversible error in a case. Um, where it comes up in my cases more often is um, the ability to impeach a witness, um, the credibility information, because obviously if there's a witness for the government that's testifying, we want to be able to attack that person's credibility. Yeah, and so um, if Dan Kavanaugh got on the stand, not only would you have all these threats, you could also show that he too stole from McStay, correct? It, yes, and in a case like this, the murder case, um, it's imperative for the defense to be able to further any theory that they might have, um, limiting or even eliminating the possibility of a defense or the possibility of you know putting on evidence that somebody else did it. Seems to me that would be if anything, a pretty, pretty, pretty big error by the judge. Pretty big error. So let's listen, though, while they're on their 15-minute afternoon break in California, um, something that happened earlier in the courtroom. So we're going to go to a clip of, we're going to actually surprise you because we want to make sure you stay tuned. Joseph, I'm sorry, Charles Merritt said that Joseph McStay was his best friend. We had that kind of admission once before in the Tammy Moore case, for those of you that follow us on Law and Crime Network, when the, the murder victim was somebody's, uh, you know, was a nice girl then. So I want you to take and take your ears, pin them right to that, that the, whatever you have, whether it's a computer, whether you're on Pluto, whether you're on Philo, and listen to the statement that Charles Merritt gave the police on February 17th, 2010. Got a Chick-fil-A. In the same complex we used to have, you had a Wendy's? Oh, Chick-fil-A. He met me at Chick-fil-A, and he bought lunch there. Was uh, Mike there? Mike, his brother, and I were... The only time I met Mike is um, at the wedding, and very... Okay, we'll talk about cr just crimes in general. Oh, hi. How are you? Uh, we're on screen, and I was talking about to myself and to my guests without you. Now you know what we're going to talk about. Sylvia Smith, did the police have tunnel vision in this case? It's 100% possible. Um, uh, well, wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. 100% possible. That's really, that's good. But now we got to prove the police had tunnel vision. So do we do that by showing they only focused on him at the beginning of the investigation? Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways you show that the police have tunnel vision. The first thing is, are they exploring other options? Are they keeping, you know, an open mind? Oftentimes in the cases like this where it's high profile, they have a lot of pressure to bring somebody in to make a conviction. And what that means is that they're trying to actually build a case against a person. Um, the tunnel, right. Yeah, now, so, now, with tunnel vision, now, now, when you when you focus, when the police focus on your client, now he didn't have an attorney here. Do you think that he made a mistake not going and bringing an attorney with him? He may have talked to one. He said he talked to one, but do you think he made a mistake not bringing an attorney with him, or does that look like guilt? Does that make the police focus more on you? I think it does make the police focus more on you, but I don't ever think there's ever a problem in having an attorney with you um, because police have tactics that they use. They can lie, they can make things up, they can feed people information. Um, there's all kinds of things that they can do um, to sort of help their case along. And then, you know, it could end up twisting somebody's words or, you know, misconstruing somebody's words. So it's always important to have an attorney there just and sort and of let me, be able let me to just say one thing, up. that point you just made, yes, McStay just said in the, in the tape at one point at the beginning, he says, I know that you guys can lie to me and, and tell me not truths. Does that hurt right. him when the jury hears that? Because they don't know why he knows that. It, it could potentially. Um, again, I think, you know, the lawyer's job is to sort of frame how the jury is hearing these things. Um, but that's important. Um, but it also is important for the jury to know, too. 
um, especially if the police are lying or the investigators are lying and they're trying to twist his words around. Um, but I also think it, it sort of rings to me a little bit, sort of a, um, it feels truthful, right? He's very aware right. of police tactics as he's saying, you're not going to twist my words around. This is what happened. This is the truth. So I can see it going both ways. Well, that's interesting. Evidence both ways. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to take a little break. But just before that we do that, let me tell you, in California, if the evidence can go both ways, the jury gets instructed at the end that they must find the way that says innocent, not guilty, unlike many other states. Now with that wise words that I didn't learn till later, we can take a break. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, where we've been covering the, the trial dealing with the horrible, horrible murders of the McStay family, the mother, the father, the four-year-old, the three-year-old, and Mr. Merritt, Mr. Ch Mr. Charles, who's called Chase Merritt, is on trial. Earlier today, the forensic anthropologist for the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office testified about the recovery scene, and she testified about whether or not you can contaminate or you have to... Or, automatically contaminate or can you prevent contamination of the recovery scene in a crime like this. I want you to really closely listen to her because I'm going to tell you I was objecting from Midtown Manhattan to downtown. And then I had seen some remains sticking out that I thought probably indicated a force. Okay. You indicated that you saw some remains sticking out. Do you recall whether they were sticking out at grave A or grave B? Well, you'd have to tell me which one you which one you designated as grave A or grave B. I okay. don't remember. So if the one in front of you, if we looked at that and said that's grave, grave B. Okay, grave B. Then it would be grave A. Now, when you do this quick canvas, how worried are you about contaminating anything around you? in terms of potential evidence? Um, moderately, I mean, we have to weigh our need to get over a large distance uh, versus um, um, preserving absolutely everything. In the desert, that's not possible anymore. So many factors have come in from animals to weather to other people, you know, coming through and all of that. The idea that you would have a pristine scene um, is something that you have to discard very early on. Well, as you're walking around that day, can you tell us, you indicated that you saw tire tracks leading up to this particular um, grave that we see in the picture. Did you see other things indicative of animal activity? Yes. Did you th see other tracks or things that have been indicative of maybe people riding dirt bikes or driving through there? Yes. Did you see other things indicative of footprints or anything like that? I don't think I saw uh, anything in terms of footprints. There was uh, general cultural debris. Anytime we're out in the desert, there are cans and shotgun shells and all of this unrelated material that you kind of keep an eye on in case it turns out to be related, but most of the time you kind of walk past it, skirt it. So as, as you go to this scene and you ultimately do this quick canvas, you indicated you are not dealing with a pristine crime scene at this point. That is correct. So if this is not a pristine crime scene, when you're walking around observing this, are you picking up items? Uh, no. I, occasionally I'll pick up animal remains uh, because I want to get them out of the field of play, if you will. Okay. Uh, and every once in a while you flip it over and make sure that you absolutely have an animal as opposed to some very unusual human. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen some unusual things. I have. Okay. So you determined that you're dealing with at least two adults and a child and potentially another victim because you see something sticking out of the other grave, which we'll for now call grave A. What do you, what do you and Deputy Avery decide to do? I, I ask him to call it in, and we ask for a deputy who can um, stand watch over the area until... A, um, a recovery can be mounted the next day because um, it, it was winter and I think by the time we found the second grade it was later it was past one past two and you certainly couldn't mount something that large before it got dark you know that's and that's my fault I didn't ask you that question do you know approximately what time it was that you responded to the scene that day no okay 
I, I want to say 11. It could have been one. I think it was around lunchtime. Okay. So you, and then you had to drive there. Okay. So Dr. Alexis Gray is going to say, and I was, objection. You could probably see me, hear me again. 53rd Street, I was in my office uptown. Objection, 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 objection. She at one point says it was impractical, let me get this right, not to contaminate with the crime scene with your own DNA when you're called in doing this. Now, everything I've been taught, Sylvia Smith, criminal defense attorney from Washington, D.C., is that exactly what the investigators try to do is prevent crime scene contamination with their own DNA. And yet, apparently, because there was DNA not from Mr. Mr. Uh, Merritt here in the in the grave somewhere, now there's they're, they're laying the foundation of the prosecution for contamination. How successful do you think the prosecution will be in convincing the jury that this was contamination? With her saying it, I, I, I don't know how successful they're going to be. I think that if the defense attorney is good, they'll point out all of the problems, prevent from contaminating a scene with your own DNA seems a bit absurd to me. And so I, I would think that any jury would understand that as well. Um, but again, it depends on how the, the attorneys are doing at framing that information. Right, right. But, I mean, yeah, it seems, it seems I, a bit absurd to you. To me, it seems like I, I literally thought I was going to have a brain aneurysm or a heart attack <laughs> with that. Now, now, if there is somebody else's DNA on either the blanket or the wife uh, Summer's clothes and they're buried down in a grave that's 17 or 18 or 12 inches or however deep it is, does that indicate, well, do you think that your expert that you're going to have to get will indicate that that's from a foreign person, not from not from a police officer or someone of the ilk. So you mean my expert saying yeah. that this DNA is? I mean, that's something you can do, right? You can have um, somebody test the DNA against everybody who handled this stuff to see if it was contaminated by the officers, by the lab techs, by the DNA analysts, all of those folks. Um, it's something you can do. But the issue is, you know, the state has the burden. Um, they have the burden also to be able to preserve the evidence. Um, and I think that's a big part of any case. Okay, so, um, and here, and here, what Alexis Gray, and we're going to listen to more of her, Alexis Gray is saying, Sylvia, is exactly what you was saying, that they took her DNA, right, to, to check it against to see if she contaminated. But I want to hear more of this theory that it's okay to possibly contaminate a crime scene or a dump scene. No, but I, I mean, when, so when you say do studies, I hear do research. Okay. Have I done research in regards to DNA? No. Have I collected a great deal of DNA? Yes. Did I attend classes that were about DNA during my um, graduate career? Yes. Is it practical to try to recover DNA from a crime scene like this? Objection foundation. Mm -hmm. No. Your Honor, I haven't heard. Can we hear? No. The objections are a little. It isn't practical because the the possibility for contamination just from the local environment is too high. When you say foundation. Mm -hmm. When you say the local environment, what is it that you're referring to? I'm, I'm talking about that desert with you know the plants and the decomposing organisms and all of those things. DNA can be recovered in a lab from the from the remains or from anything if the if it's intact. Uh, but it's not something that we would be trying to necessarily recover at that location. Okay, so that was a clip of Dr. Alexis Gray, who testified earlier today that indeed a crime scene can be contaminated by plants or animals around it. Okay, we'll see how that flies with the jury in the future. But right now, guess what? The court is back, and we've been watching that monitor. Judge Smith is on the bench, so we're going to go right back in and see what they're going to do next. Probably listen to more of the statement of the defendant, Charles Chase Merritt. Okay. All right. This is the statement. Listen to this. We have all sorts of admissions here, but are they really admissions? When when defendant admits to the police that he was he thinks he was the last person to see Joseph McStay alive, that he talked to him at six o'clock, he thinks he may have been the last person to talk to him alive. Are those really admissions? Or Sylvia Smith, my criminal defense attorney from Washington D.C., who's tried a gazillion felony cases, could they be something else? And if they are, what would you tell the jury? Yes, I think they could be. I think his statements can be bad 
and in a certain light, but I also think his statements can be completely Why? consistent with somebody being innocent. Why? Why? Why are they consistent with innocence? Tell me. Because if he doesn't think anything's wrong, for example, he has no idea that they're dead in a desert somewhere or something bad has happened to them. He's trying to give the police as much information as possible to help get, you know, get to them. So, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, in the context, it sounds, you know, he's sitting on trial for murder. That the atmospherics of that sound bad, right? He's the last person to see him. He has all this interactions with them. He's his financial partner, all of that. But at the end of the day, if he was 100% innocent and he's telling the police exactly what happened and giving as much information, um, that is 100% consistent with and him being innocent. That, ladies help, help, and gentlemen, help. is why we have the jury charge in California that if it points to guilt and innocence, you got to take innocence because I really hadn't quite thought of that. We have to take a break. Stay with us. We'll be back soon. Well, wow, this is Charles Merritt. He is talking to the police uh, within two weeks after the whole uh, McStay family disappears. He's telling us now how Joseph was sick for a long time. Hmm, that starts my mind thinking about why he was sick. But that's for next Wednesday when I come back and listen to you. In the meantime, okay, Sylvia Smith from Washington, D.C., our criminal defense attorney. All right, give me your best punch. What do you open to the jury? Punch it for me, Sylvia. Tell us why he's not guilty. The jury is not supposed to do the state's work for them. The state has to put together a case based on reliable evidence, a not botched investigation, um, reliable DNA results, and not ambiguous statements made by the defendant. Um, if it can go, like you said, if it can go one way or the other, you have to acquit. And I think that's, at this point, that's what I see here. And that, case that, that, that's what you see. If they can go one way or another, they have to acquit. Leads me to thinking about a famous another California case. What could that possibly be? Hmm. Hmm. Could be O.J. Simpson, maybe. Right. Well, if, if, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Sylvia, those are themes that defense attorneys rely on, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's what I like about it. I mean, you know, you're either guilty, you're innocent, the prosecution's proven it, they haven't proven it. In any event, this is a tragic case, whether or not they proved it or not against this defendant. Justice determined mandates that we find the real killer, whoever that is. Maybe it is this man. We don't know until the jury makes its determination, and maybe not even then. But in any event, Law and Crime Network has been covering this case from gavel to gavel. The murder, the terrible sledgehammer killings of two little boys, a mother and a father who were missing from their families for over three and a half years. I'm Linda Kenny Bodden. I'll look forward to covering this case next with you, week with you. In the meantime, tomorrow, come back here, 9 a.m. for Jesse Weber. He'll be covering this case and more. Bye-bye.